This presentation will teach you a little bit about the First World War, known at the time as the Great War, because the world had never known such a widespread and all-out war before. I am calling this an idiosyncratic introduction, because there is way too much to say in the amount of time available. I have picked and chosen some things to emphasize. Your book, The First World War, A Very Short Introduction, has also chosen a few things to emphasize. One thing you can count on in this class is your ability to find out much more about any particular topic that interests you, and I encourage you to do that. It's always smart to start with a map when you're talking about European war. You will notice some countries that we have today are absent, and other countries were present that we no longer have today. But the most important thing to notice about this map is the location of Germany. On Germany's east side is Russia, and on its west is France. These two nations were traditionally allied with one another against Germany. You might also notice Austria-Hungary beneath Germany. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was an ambitious power in the pre-Great War days. Allied with Germany, the Austro-Hungarian Empire had an eye on the Balkan states to its south, partly out of fear that these nations preferred their fellow Slavic country, Russia, to their northern neighbor. At the time of the Great War, most nations in Europe were ruled by kings. Let's look at some of them. In England, King George V was on the throne. A grandson of Queen Victoria, George had ascended the throne in 1910. The ruler of Russia was his first cousin, Nicholas II, who had been Tsar since 1894. And on the throne in Germany, their first cousin, William II, had been Kaiser since 1888. Queen Victoria had a lot of children, and as was the practice of monarchs in that day, she married them off to other European royalty in the interest of world peace and probably also of British domination. George, Nicky, and Willie spent summers together in England. Interestingly, in light of the Great War's alliances, George and Nicky were best friends, but no one liked Willie. Outside British influence was the royal family of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The emperor, Franz Joseph, had lost his only son to suicide some years before, and so his heir was his nephew, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand had married against his uncle's wishes to a countess, Sophie, who was merely noble and not royal. Franz Joseph agreed to the marriage only with the proviso that Sophie not receive the titles or honors of the heir apparent's wife, and that her children with Franz Ferdinand not be in line for the throne. As you can imagine, Franz Ferdinand did not like his uncle much after this, and his uncle returned the dislike with interest. On June 28, 1914, Franz Ferdinand and Sophie were visiting Sarajevo when they were assassinated by a Serbian national. Franz Joseph thought this a great opportunity to extend his empire into the Balkan states on his southern border. The assassination of the Archduke is generally considered the catalyst for the start of the war. Austria-Hungary gave Serbia some conditions meant to be impossible for them to meet and invaded Serbia on July 28, 1914. At the same time, Germany inv invaded Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. Why, you ask? Well, remember that map we just looked at? Germany has potential enemies to either side. It really doesn't want a war with both at once, but since they are allied, that's what it's going to get. The German plan was to quickly move through neutral Belgium and Luxembourg, small countries with tiny militaries, in order to conquer France before Russia can mobilize its troops. Germany does have shared border with France, but the way is easier if you go through the Low Country, so that's what they did, as in World War II's Blitzkrieg. Britain was allied to France and Russia, and had an interest in defending neutral countries, so it entered the war a few days later, on August 3, 1914. The war lasted until November 11, 1918, when the armistice ceasing hostilities went into effect at 11 a.m. This is what Europe looked like during the war. Nations in salmon color are part of the Allies. Nations in aqua are part of the Central Powers. 
The red lines are trench lines because trench warfare is perhaps the most widely known thing about the Great War. Here are the sides in more detail. The First World War was truly a global war, although fighting was confined to a few places on the globe. The combatant nations had empires in various locations. In fact, one of the real causes of the war was the combatant nation's desire to shore up and even increase their empires and drew soldiers from around the world. Here are some Scots soldiers marching to the front in kilts and steel helmets to the sound of bagpipe music. Here are German soldiers in a studio portrait taken before heading off to war and in a candid shot of a soldier who has seen battle. This is a French soldier in the characteristic uniform of the war's early days. The French were proud of their snazzy uniforms, especially the bright red pants, but they were persuaded to adopt a less visible uniform after a short time in the trenches. The British had already dispensed with their bright red uniform jackets during the Boer War, when being a bright red object in a brown field proved disadvantageous. During the Great War, Germans wore field gray uniforms, British khaki, and French soldiers wore horizon blue. These English soldiers in khaki uniforms posed for a picture in camp. Note the swagger stick in the officer's hand. They are wearing ankle-high boots with puttees, strips of cloth, wrapped around their lower legs to keep water and other foreign things out of their shoes. This typically didn't work very well. Members of the Chinese Labor Corps were brought from British imperial possessions in China, chiefly Hong Kong and Canton. They were supposed to do behind the lines lifting and carrying, not combat. But if you go to British cemeteries in Flanders, you will find graves and monuments to the many Chinese people who died in the Great War. One of England's, England's most important imperial possessions was India, and many Indian soldiers fought in the Great War. Some units of the Indian Army were especially known for bravery, and the British brought these units to help them defend the Western Front. The combatant nations of the Great War were, in a sense, fighting over rights to Africa, the last place on the globe where imperial nations could hope to colonize. These African soldiers were fighting for France, their imperial overlords, who they actually wanted to get out of their country. Similarly, a large percentage of British troops were Irish at, at the time when the Irish independence movement was very active as the Irish people sought self-determination. Let's turn now to some important battles of the Great War. Passchendaele, or the Battle of the Mud, is also known as Third Ypres. It was fought in appalling conditions at a place in the trench lines where the British had already fought a number of bloody and useless battles. Gallipoli was fought by Anzac troops, soldiers from Australia and New Zealand. It was an attempt to shift the location of battle from the trenches of Flanders and northern France into another theater, the Ottoman Empire, now Turkey. The Battle of the Somme began on July 1, 1916, and went until November of that year, when everyone settled back into the trenches they had inhabited on June 30th. The battle had 57,000 casualties, most in the first few minutes of the battle. It marks a turning point in attitudes toward the war among both combatants and civilians. The Great War is known for trench warfare. Entrenching is a defensive maneuver. The British Expeditionary Force established the first trench lines to stop the German advance into France in the war's early days. But the same qualities that make it a good way to stop an enemy make it an awkward way to attack an enemy, with the result that for most of the war, there was a great deal of bloodshed, but not much movement. This map shows us a close-up of the trench line on the Western Front. You can see that it reaches from the sea to the mountains of Switzerland. Most of the fighting took place in the lowlands of the English Channel side of the front, an area that has a naturally high water table. This part of Europe, called Flanders, had been made suitable for farming through elaborate and ancient drainage systems, which were disrupted by the war's shelling, 
making much of the western front a sea of mud. Within the trenches, everything looked more or less alike, so soldiers used signs like these on display at the Imperial War Museum, London, to keep track of where they were. Signs like, do not stand about here. If you are not hit, someone else will be, provided important information as well. In the trenches, soldiers could, for the most part, move around, around fairly freely, as long as they kept their heads down. Of course, they were under more or less constant bombardment. Artillery fire was the number one cause of death in the war. But the trenches were designed to allow one to walk about from place to place. Getting into the trenches was another matter. Generally speaking, one could travel into or out of the trenches only under cover of darkness. Here are some startling casualty figures from the war. Huge numbers of young men died in the war, causing demographic problems for a generation afterwards. The reason so many died was a mismatch between the 19th century tactics used and the more accurate and higher powered artillery, in addition to other newly developed or enhanced weaponry. The Great War is considered the first truly modern war, a war of the industrial age that allowed weapons and ammunition to be mass produced at enormous scale. Many of the weapons of the Great War had been used before, such as the rifle or artillery guns, but the versions used in the war were more accurate, mass-produced, more easily operated and replaced. Machine guns had been in use since the Civil War Gatling gun. For World War I, designers had figured out how to air-cool the gun so that it could be fired continuously without melting or misshaping the barrel, which would affect accuracy. Poison gas was a new invention of the war. The main kinds used were tear gas, phosgene, chlorine, and mustard gas. Poison gases caused agonizing deaths for soldiers who were exposed, causing them to, for instance, drown in their own lung secretions. The soldiers in this picture have been blinded by gas. High explosive artillery was the number one cause of fatality and injury in the war. The shells were both more accurate and more deadly. The ground near the trenches was pockmarked with shell holes, often filled with water like the ones in this picture, which provided limited cover for soldiers during attacks. Aircraft were a brand new adventure during the Great War, with the first powered flight having taken place in 1903. Among the puzzles aircraft designers had to figure out in World War I was how to shoot a machine gun through a propeller without blowing it off the plane. Pilots also had to work out tactics for aerial combat. Here is a kind of aircraft we no longer see in war, the Zeppelin. They were used in bombing raids over England. Suspended from the Zeppelin was a capsule with a pilot and bomber. The bomber would heave bombs over the side of the capsule. This wasn't exactly pinpoint bombing. Tanks were developed in the Great War by the British and used for the first time in the Battle of the Somme, where they bogged down in the mud, becoming sitting ducks for the Germans. Camouflage was also new, a development based on cubist paintings of all things. The kind of camouflage on this ship was called Dazzle. It was meant to fool the eye of submarines, especially. A German fireman developed flamethrowers, a device with a tank of thickened gasoline, a hose, and a nozzle through which flame could be directed at enemy troops. This weapon was primarily a terror weapon. You would use it when attacking enemy trenches in the hope that the enemy would flee before the flames. Gender roles necessarily shifted during the war, when men were off at the front fighting. Women worked in munitions factories, making weapons, shells, and ammunition. The women who worked in these factories were usually working class women, and they typically earned much more than before the war and had a great deal more independence. On the downside, they were sometimes blown up, and most of them were poisoned by sulfur while working with TNT. Women also worked as drivers, 
Here you see a messenger, but they drove ambulances, buses, trams, trucks, some of them even very near the front lines. Women were still the housekeepers in their societies, and so governments targeted them with messages meant to conserve the society's resources for war work. Women were called up for national service, either in auxiliary units of the military or in organizations like the Women's Land Army, which tried to replace farmers with city girls. Women were useful as images in advertising, such as this ad suggesting that Germans would come and rape your wives and daughters if you didn't immediately enlist. This ad aims to get men to give up their civilian lives and become soldiers by suggesting that everyone is doing it. After 1916 in Britain, conscription made such ads less necessary. These ads aimed at women, primarily, assert a new social standard of self-denial. This German ad asks women to cut their long hair and donate it to the war effort. Germany had been blockaded for the whole war, and the country soon ran short of vital supplies that it had imported before, such as rubber or hemp. Even animals had a part to play in the war. This dog is laying telephone wire for communications in the war zone. Horses were commandeered at the beginning of the war, but combatants on both sides soon saw they would be useless as cavalry mounts. Instead, horses were used as beasts of burden, pulling caissons and ambulances. This German zoo elephant did his part for the Kaiser. Pigeons were vital to the war effort on both sides because modern communication, i.e. the telephone and radio, was often too delicate to function under bombardment and the harsh conditions of the war zone. On the English side, there was an edict mandating court-martial for anyone caught eating a homing pigeon. Animals also served as mascots, usually on ships. In the Middle East, where Egypt and Palestine were the scene of battle between the British and Ottoman Empire, the Camel Corps provided necessary transportation. Societies at war need buy-in from their population in order to prosecute the war effort. Even children have a role in that. Because women were working, either taking the place of men or working in new war-related industries, childcare was a requirement. These children are attending a nursery school while their mothers work. Children were used in propaganda, as in this famous example. This little girl is so sweet, I'm certain no daddy could possibly deny her a war bond the present children cherish most. The U.S. enlisted school children to grow gardens at their schools to avoid food shortages with farmers off at the front. Of course, the biggest way in which children participated in the war was by saying goodbye to the young men in their lives. They were encouraged to play soldier and to hope for the day they would be old enough to sign up themselves. Many underage boys signed up surreptitiously. There is a story of a 13-year-old soldier whose mother found him at the front and swiftly returned him home. This letter from a nine-year-old Irish boy to Lord Kitchener, head of the British Army, volunteering his services as a bicycle messenger, is reasonably typical of the way kids felt about the war. Kids were also used to collect scrap metal, nuts for oil, and other things to help the war effort. In all combatant nations, the burden of fighting the war and the amount of resources that went to supporting it meant food rationing, shortages of products like paper, and substitutions like ground blackened toast instead of coffee. Some names you might encounter for the Great War besides World War I. We also derived some slang from the war 
terms we still use today. Here's a map of Europe after the war. What changes do you see? The picture here is of the Cenotaph, a war memorial in Whitehall, the main government office street in London. On this slide, you can also read a stanza of a poem that is often used in Britain and the Commonwealth at ceremonies marking Armistice Day, now often Remembrance Day. Because America was only in the Great War for one year, it doesn't have the resonance to us that World War II has, for example. But in Europe, the war has left lasting marks on the landscape and on the psyches of the people. For the 100th anniversary of the start of the war, British artists made a number of installations and other artworks. Here is one, called Blood Swept Lands and Fields of Red, which filled the moat at the Tower of London with thousands of ceramic poppies.